a 20 minutes to take about 20 minutes of their uh, uh, presentation, share it with us. We will be listening quite closely to what they are to say, to try and understand whether they are scoring us well, or are they saying we did not perform very well? We never lived perhaps to the aspirations of our constitution. How well have we been informed by the preamble of our constitution in our daily activities and engagement. So in that 20 minutes, at the end of each, we will then allow the next speaker to join. And thereafter, we will uh, 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 allow the risk before we perhaps take the response of the deputy minister, take a few of the questions that would come so that the panelists can comment and then finally allow the deputy minister to respond. And if we still have the time, we will reflect on whether or not we will be taking further comments and questions. The, 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 the questions and comments can be directed to our chat box and we will try to reflect. We know that human rights topic is a very interesting topic and therefore it really is going to cause excitement and there will be therefore much contestation and debates, particularly on whether or not indeed we only having more of the highs than of the lows. On that note, therefore, I am going to let our first member of the panelist, Judge Navi Pillay, to present on the very topic that I had indicated that Judge Navi Pillay will be presenting on, particularly being the, 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 the question of the, the, the threats to the constitutional democracy emanating from the recent unrest, the positives and the negative aspects of the constitution. And we will be listening quite closely, Judge, as you give us some of your recommendations and as you inform us whether or not what have we to learn on the laws that we have as years. Over to you, Judge Nabipile. Thank you very much, Advocate Mafajana, for your kind introduction. And may I greet very warmly uh, the Honorable Deputy Minister of Justice, John Jeffrey, and my fellow pan panelists and, and participants. I notice from our screen that we have quite a few participants. Um, I am sure that all of us will agree that this 25th anniversary of the South African Constitution will be seared in our memory forever because apart from the fact that we are going through the worst COVID surge and are all under lockdown, but mainly because we are holding this panel amidst the smoldering ashes of the violent unrest that occurred in the last 10 days between July 9th to 19th. The unrest led to the burning, looting and destruction of thousands of shops and malls, resulting in the deaths as of today of 276 individuals. And of course, we face drastic food shortages, transport difficulties, and so on. So more than ever, this represents the most serious threat to our constitutional democracy. So I feel that it is necessary to place on record the remarks addressed to us by our President Cyril Ramaphosa on Friday, 16 July, 2021. So bear with me as I quote him fully, because these are the most stunning, unusual circumstances. This is what he told the anxious nation. The events of the past week were deliberately coordinated and well-planned attacks on our democracy. The constitutional order of our country is under threat. The current instability and ongoing incitement to violence constitutes a direct contravention of our constitution and rule of law. These actions are intended 
to cripple the economy of, of our country, to cause social instability and severely weaken or destroy the democratic state. Using the pretext of a political grievance, those behind these acts have sought to provoke a popular insurrection amongst our people. They have sought to exploit the social and economic conditions under which many South Africans live, conditions of poverty, inequality, and unemployment that worsened since the coronavirus pandemic, and to provoke criminal acts of wanton looting by ordinary citizens and criminal networks. And he continued, the ensuing acts were used as a smokescreen to commit economic sabotage on infrastructure such as roads and transport vehicles. These instigators sought to manipulate the poor and vulnerable through widespread use of social media. Yet this insurrection failed and failed to get the support of South Africans who stood up in defense of our hard-won democracy. And of course, he also conceded the government's own failure of being poorly prepared for the insurrection. And we all know that on Sunday, 18 July, Minister of Defense, Nossis Biwa, Mapisa Nakula, told the Joint Parliamentary Committee on Defense that she did not believe it was an insurrection and that the un unrest showed signs of counter-revolution in the form of thuggery and criminality. So whatever is meant by her in her statement, both her statement and that of the president bring home the shocking realization that we have just experienced one of the most serious threats to our constitutional democracy. The good news, however, is that the people of South Africa did not support the insurrection. They stood by the constitution. The attempted armed insurrection was diffused because the people demonstrated a clear understanding, support and preference for constitutional rule. Already we, we see on our screens communities collaborating in humanitarian efforts for the protection of vulnerable areas, joining in cleanup operations, uh, food aid and food distribution, thereby acting out the ethos in our constitutions, which is respect for the human rights of everyone in our country. Now, the further good news is that the constitutional values of accountability are being put into immediate effect as arrests and court appearances of suspects are being rolled out. As much as we criticize the slowness of the process, we are following this process of investigation, prosecution, and holding people accountable for having instigated this virus. So let me now review our constitutional journey over 25 years. It has been a journey of highs and lows, as, as the topic for this uh, afternoon's discussion indicates. Now, from the uh, perspective of the international community, the Constitution itself, together with the Bill of Rights, is hailed as an achievement of enlightened progressive democracy. The Constitution provides a clear framework for good governance, and the Bill of Rights draws from the most advanced human rights standards embodied in international instruments. It was finalized after ex extensive consultations and contributions of civil society in our country. And despite compromises that had to be made in the negotiations with the former apartheid government, it can claim to be a homegrown product owned by South Africans. South Africa, as you know, was a founding member of the United Nations in 1945, with apartheid leader Jan Smuts helping to craft the UN Charter's preamble, including its reference to human rights. It is remarkable to think that leaders and states who are actively violating human rights were among those expressing 
their importance. Of course, as commitment to human rights grew internationally and the horrors of apartheid became known more widely and understood, South Africa was suspended from the UN by the General Assembly for its apartheid policies in 1974 and was only readmitted in 1994 when the country dismantled apartheid. So its history of expulsion and readmission into the UN membership has built and reinforced expectations that South Africa would and should hold a principled view and position on human rights on the international scene and in Africa in particular. The new South Africa was in this sense born in a human rights moment. Human rights and democratic principles became founding principles of our constitution, a document that has since become the envy and blueprint of many states emerging from autocracy into the promise of a democratic and human rights abiding future. We likewise, in our constitution, situated our country not on an island unto itself, but as a member of a community of states aspiring to make respect for human rights a global norm. The preamble of our constitution is specific that our place is within, I quote, the family of nations. That means we will never claim South Africa first, like Donald Trump's America first. Our country can't go it alone, especially as we are so intrinsically part of Africa. We must therefore follow the path of multilateralism, which is working collectively with all countries. In a welcome expression of our constitutional ethos, President Ramaphosa, as chair of the AU until February this year, pressed for the urgent and equal distribution of COVID-19 vaccines to COVAX countries. He condemned the ugly trends of nationalism, greed and hoarding by rich countries of the vaccines to the detriment of poor countries, mainly in Africa. The, our constitution aims for a fundamental transformation of South African society, seeking to address the harms of the past and to develop a future based on social justice, on a democratic system of government and advancing economic and social rights to all people living in the country. The constitutional rights of equality and dignity in the Bill of Rights are explicit statements of principle that lead the ongoing effort towards reaching meaningful equality for all. The law is a formal expression of public policy that plays a crucial role in advancing social norms. The constitution provides not only for equal protection of the law and non-discrimination, but also for the credible and progressive process of reparation for past exclusion, dispossession, and indignity within the discipline of the constitutional framework. Our constitution lays the foundation for a rights-based society. The country has signed and ratified all the treaties and conventions that were adopted internationally by the UN, except for the optional protocol to the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. And therefore, our country is sending a clear notice to the world of its serious intention to realize rights now, in leading the transformation to democracy, the state has enacted many enabling legislation, to name a few, the Promotion of Access to Information Act, Promotion of Administrative Justice Act, Promotion of Equality and Prevention of Unfair Discrimination Act, and it has established all the Chapter 9 oversight institutions including the National Human Rights Institute, the Gender Commission, Equality Commission, the Office of the Public Protector, 
as well as specialized courts such as the land courts. It has, so it has made serious strides in realizing the human rights to housing, healthcare, access to justice, and freedom of speech and assembly. So uh, let me say, as, my, as from my experience as High Commissioner for Human Rights, where I heard thousands and thousands of heartbreaking experiences from people, not in the past, but ongoing, and how little access they had uh, to, to remedies, to, for, for some relief, or to have their rights spelt out. Just, just to give you two examples. One, I was in South Sudan, sitting under the trees, talking to women from very remote villages. They were all speaking different languages. So two of the mothers told me that their daughters had been killed by their fathers. Their bodies were buried in the backyard because the father had arranged their, these young girls, they were like 12 years old, they, they had arranged a marriage with the uh, really old men in exchange for cattle. The girls had refused, the fathers killed them, the mothers went to the police, but nothing happened. And they said to me, do we not have rights over the children that we gave birth to? So that kind of helplessness. I was also associated with lawyers in the United States. The US has a very good constitution adopted even before the um, Universal Declaration of Human Rights of, or the UN Charter. But they do not have the equality clause or the, or the right to dignity in their constitution. And I know of many cases, for instance, the women workers who are mainly black working at Walmart were being paid less than the men. They were being discriminated, but it was not possible for the Supreme Court to receive that case but they could have done so if they'd had an equality clause. So I know that here our youth don't want to hear about the problems in the rest of the world, but we need to understand that in order to appreciate the value of having a constitution. You know, some of the most contentious areas of conflict that are ripping apart countries uh, elsewhere in the world have been put to rest once and for all in our country. So to name a few, the right to reproductive health, that's abortions, is huge, huge fights in the United States over that. Freedom of religion, there are so many religious conflicts. The abolition of the death penalty, we are very enlightened in, in respect of not taking life. Equality for women, children's rights to be free from forced or early marriage, for instance, and the right to sexual orientation. The rights embodied in our constitution may well remain paper rights, though, had it not been for the activism of civil society. And, you know, our, our speaker on our panel, Janine Hicks, is a very good example of such an activist. But more importantly, why our rights don't just remain on paper but are being realized is because of the independence of our judicial system. You will not believe how this is lacking in many, many countries, how people are not allowed to criticize, dissent is suppressed, journalists are arrested and have to face long terms of imprisonment, if not death sentence. So we don't have this because we have institutions such as an independent judiciary to protect these rights for us. Our courts, especially the Constitutional Court, have, let me say, breathed life into the vision of the Constitution. And in giving effect to constitutional principles, the judiciary embeds its rulings with the sense of the realities of the conditions on the ground. Let me quote what former Chief Justice Arthur Chaskelson said in the Subramani case that came before the Constitutional Court. He said, social rights are indispensable to all other rights. The legal right to equality will remain a hollow paper promise unless there is greater commitment and will to deliver on economic, social and cultural rights. We live in a society in which 
there are great disparities in wealth. Millions of people are living in deplorable conditions and in great poverty. There are high levels of unemployment, inadequate social security, and many who do not have access to clean water or to adequate health services. The commitment to address these conditions and to transform our society into one in which there will be human dignity, freedom, and equality lay at the heart of the new constitutional order. For as long as these conditions continue to exist, that aspiration will have a hollow ring. Another former Chief Justice of our Constitutional Court, Ngobo CJ, said in the Glenister case, corruption has become a scourge in our country and it poses a real danger to our developing democracy. It undermines the ability of the government to meet its obligations to fight poverty and to deliver on other social and economic rights guaranteed in our Bill of Rights. So let me begin to say that I consider it as a serious flaw in our constitution that a provision for an independent anti-corruption authority with power to investigate and act against all forms of corruption without fear or favor, safeguarded against political interference, is missing as a provision in our constitution. Now, I regard this omission as serious because corruption has become rampant with harmful impacts on the enjoyment of the human rights of all people. Complaints of poor service deliveries and obstacles to access to relief are very common. The economic consequences of corruption have contributed to our country being downgraded to junk status. Of note, our ongoing efforts such as reinforcing the security services and strengthening the National Prosecution Authority, establishing the Judicial Commission of Inquiry into allegations of state capture, corruption and fraud in the public sector. Uh, these are very important steps that are being taken to address this. But there is still huge dissatisfaction in South Africa over these huge levels of corruption stemming particularly from purpose, people in very high political office. Let me say that during my six year service as UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, I highlighted the highs in our constitution as exemplary universal values, worthy of emulation in difficult human rights situations in the world. And the studies conducted by my office, the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, indicate that lack of protection against human rights violations occurred, occurred more in states that did not have a constitution and bill of rights. And wherever I address NGOs and youth in Africa and other parts of the world, People agreed with that. They wished that they'd had a constitution. But on my return to South Africa, I addressed um, numerous uh, student bodies at universities. I was very surprised at the reaction of our youth and student population to the constitution. They were venting their anger and exasperation at the lack of service deliveries and continuing poverty, inequality and unemployment and their uh, educational challenges in, at the constitution. Instead of directing their expectations and holding to account the political authority whose obligation it is to deliver the promises and rights envisaged in the constitution. Nonetheless, we cannot escape acknowledging the lows when elements of the Constitution and its vision of a fundamental transformation of South African society seeking to redress the past are viewed in the light of the concrete realities in our country. So here I had the benefit of looking at a very comprehensive study and assessment 
of the performance of the South African Constitution on, on the 20th anniversary that was made by the International Institute for Democratic and Electoral Assistance, IDEA for, for short. And I found that study very illuminating because it tells us how the situation was at the 20th anniversary. And I'm going to read some of their comments so that you can judge for yourself whether there has been any improvement on the occasion of the 25th anniversary or whether the situation has worsened. So one, they spoke about the increasing sense of disaffection from politics by all South Africans. Two, the one party dominance of the ANC has led to a worrying capture of democratic institutions by the ruling party and the constitution has not been able to insulate many institutions from unduly heavy political appointments. Three, there is widespread corruption or a perception of widespread corruption around many institutions of the state, including the police. Political interference has been rife with the National Prosecuting Authority. This is why it's being addressed today. Four, the entitlements guaranteed by the Constitution in areas such as housing, healthcare, and education are still a long way from being realized, and the government's ability to provide public goals is in doubt, generating massive service delivery protests. Five, without an ele effective electoral threat, that is, people pressure, the ANC has lacked the usual democratic constraints on its operation. It has been able to push through appointments in key institutions and to provide cover for individuals who fail to perform in their jobs, which in turn was a recipe for corruption. South Africa, this is the sixth point, South Africa faces difficult economic conditions and discontent with the current ruling parties. Party. As these grow, the worry is that key features of the constitutional compact will unravel and that that may lead to serious instability. Seven point, I, good laws do exist to me. govern change. Sorry. Me, sorry. Uh, yes, I'm sorry to, to interrupt Judge whilst he's still delivering. Could you just round up? Uh, we have uh, given each 20 minutes. I've given you more than 20 to 25. Could you just wrap up, please? I Thanks. certainly will. Just rounding up. Um, so the seventh point, good laws ex do exist to govern change and ensure accountability, but in reality, they are often not complied with or are subject to obstructive approaches by key institutions, such as law enforcement. Also unhelpful are the attempts at political control over decisions that should be independent. Eighth point, on achieving the constitutional goal of social justice, forward-looking steps were taken through the recognition of social economic rights, but progress has been inadequate. The constitution has not eradicated prejudice and absolute poverty, and relative inequality has grown since the advent of constitutional democracy. And then we have section 25 of the Constitution on Land, which we know was a compromise between the declared government's interest in preserving white land ownership and the ANC's interest in redistribution of land. Nevertheless, it still is an explicit provision for land reform. Many pieces of legislation have been adopted to give effect to the need for land tenure, security, restitution, redistribution. The programs, however, seem to have gone towards economic compensation instead of title to land. So land then remains a burning issue. Overall, in conclusion, let me say that the constitutional order has been successful in channeling the central tension that existed at the time of drafting into a legal structure. However, there is an increasing sense that individuals need to go outside these structures to make political gains. 
And the protest laws have not helped create a culture of nonviolent protest. So this, these are some of the comments that emerged from that study at the 20th anniversary of the Constitution. The vision of the Constitution holds out the promise of a decent, just, and democratic society in which everyone who lives in South Africa can achieve fulfillment and flourish. So let us, on the occasion of the 25th anniversary, make the strong call for a recommitment to the original vision and rededication to, to achieve the goals of the Constitution. Thank you very much, Edith. Thank you, Judge Pile. We thank you very much for, for, for the very insight and immense knowledge that you have shared with us in the space of human rights. We really appreciate that. We are also very thankful that your assessment was both a very balanced one and informative one. You looked at the highs and you looked at the lows and you also touched on where we need to improve. Outstanding to me is the fact that uh, your, your, your wish and desire that we really have to try and ensure that we get institutions that will stop corruption and protect them within our constitution. That's much appreciated, but much more will come when people will be posing questions as they interact with your paper and presentation. But we really appreciate your insightful knowledge the experiences that you have seen in other countries, and the fact that it's not only the paper, but it is how we translate it in our day-to-day -day lives. We appreciate that uh, presentation and input, and we request it to stay further as the other presenters will be presenting theirs and later on to participate in the questions that will come from the people on, 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 on the platform. Thank you. Thank you. May I now uh, 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 in, uh, I have introduced our, our speakers. I am going to now request Sifulu uh, 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 Fellow Simule to present his uh, paper. He is going to present his paper particularly on the topic that I had briefly highlighted. And I will request to Fulu Fulu, please Fulu, try to stay within your 20 minutes. I am more good at the timing. I could be the extra ref who sits on the line to guide the ref who is on the field. Over to you, Atsi Fulu Fulu. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Program Director. And um, it's good to have this kind of platform, may I say, uh, greetings to our DM, um, Honorable John Jeffrey. Uh, it's good to see you on the platform. Uh, we last engaged when we were launching the National Action Plan to combat racism, racial discrimination, xenophobia, and related intolerance in Pretoria. Um, and it's good to have a very lengthy uh, and good informative uh, background that was laid by uh, our judge, Judge Navipile. Uh, thank you very much uh, for having us as COMSA. So I will be talking from the integrated approach point of view, uh, which will then also focus a bit of the work that uh, Consortium for Refugees and Migrants do in the country to make sure that everyone who lives within uh, the South African borders is afforded an opportunity of a democratic uh, government, a, a democratic life, and a fair, equitable access to all basic needs that are enshrined in our constitution. Um, in my introduction, maybe one can start by saying, where will we be without this booklet in this democratic country that we live in, in South Africa? It's quite a nice booklet. I always carry this booklet wherever I go, because to me, this is what guides everyone's lives in South Africa. Yes, we might own our own lives, but when it comes to living and engaging and participating in any democratic system, authorities and processes, the constitution prevails to give us the guidance and to lay foundation in all policies and the laws and the legal style that we all endure to have in the democratic country, which is South Africa. I will start my presentation. I will share the screen. 
uh, so that I can quickly uh, project my presentation. Um, I don't know, Sia, if I have the right to share my screen. Yes, you have the right to share your screen, uh, Mr. Fikimu. Thank you very much, Sia. Um, my presentation, as uh, the program director has indicated, focuses much on the integrative uh, approach that we have or that the Constitution provides in the South African uh, as, a, as a republic. Um, this is a 25th anniversary of our lovely Constitution, a book or a Constitution that is highly recognized by every single country around the world. The way it has been crafted, the way it affords, and the way it guides us in terms of how the powers are segregated within the Republic of South Africa. So my presentation or my projection will we'll form this part. We will have COMSA introduction, which will be quickly, and then a, a congratulatory message. And then we why celebrate the Constitution, which we all know, and then importance of the Constitution to the COMSA's work, which will I, I will dwell much on that topic. And then the recommendation that we will be uh, sending to the uh, Department of Justice and the Constitutional Development. So this is our congratulation message uh, for the Department of Justice uh, on the 25th anniversary of the Constitution. We are saying congratulations on your 25 years of successful management and implementation of the South African Constitution. Overcoming 25 tremendous challenging years of our young democracy that continues to grow older steadily is not an easy thing to achieve. Well done. This is a huge step towards our democratic country's future. And as, a, as COMSA, we can't wait to live to witness many more constitutional development and democratic years to come. Of course, we are over 24, 27 years into democratic state and we have seen much critical and most, most criticism and most um, progressive comments relating to our constitution. You will be aware that there are quite a number of things that are currently happening in our country, uh, of which Judge Navipile has alluded to some of those. We had the constitutional judgment that took place two weeks ago, uh, which led to quite a number of um, alleged unrest uh, that took place in our country, which has led to the damage um, and the looting of the shops. Uh, as Comsa, we highly condemn all those actions of criminality and the looting of the shops, which then destabilizes the economic development in our township and which drags again the development of our country when it comes to economic and the activities that takes place in our township. COMSA is a national network with the current number of 26 member organization in good standing whose main objectives are, uh, and mission are the promotion and the protection of the human rights of asylum seekers, refugees, and migrants in a ways that promote well-being of all in South Africa, the region, and globally. COMSA's work and its members. COMSA, COMSA's work involves engaging in advocacy, lobbying, including policy submission, coordination, and network building, capacity building, community engagement, and dialogues, rights awareness, and information sharing. All these are made possible because our constitution provides that platform in the freedom of association, in the freedom of movement, and in the freedom of uh, opinion and social uh, orientation group belonging. COMSA members include legal practitioners, community-based refugee and migrant-led organization, advice offices, academic institution, humanitarian assistant, and social service providers, amongst others. And this group of organizations combined, they then comprised our membership-based organization called COMSA. Why celebrate the constitution in South Africa, which is our booklet and our supreme law of the country? Its aim is to heal the division of the past and establish this, a society based on democratic values, social justice, fundamental human rights. And what are those human rights that we are going to be discussing in this presentation? It also lays the foundation for the democratic and open society in which government is based on the will of the people and in which every citizen is equal 
protected by the law. As you know, in South Africa, everyone who lives in South Africa, the life is protected and the constitution prevails in laying that foundation under chapter two of the Bill of Rights in providing those rights so that everybody can be and can enjoy the rights that are enshrined in a chapter two. And its founding values of the constitution is also important for us to be celebrating the 25th anniversary of the constitution. The human dignity, the achievement of equality and advancement of human rights and freedom, non-racialism and non-sexism, supremacy of the constitution, which is the supreme law of the country. Importance of the constitution to COMSA's work. It is a supreme law of the country. That's what we need to be celebrating in this 25th anniversary. Nothing or there is no any other law can surpass the constitution of South Africa. When we have the constitution, we know that we have the country in our hands as citizens, as non-nationals, as people who are residing within the Republican borders. The constitution protects and promotes the human rights of all people within the Republic of South Africa with no prejudices. Hence it states in its preamble that everyone is equally protected before the law, which means that no one can be discriminated or there is no any law that can be applied in the country where prejudices will have a space or where discrimination will have a ground to play. The constitution comes to protect and prevail in that circumstances. The applicable use of the word everyone as contained in the chapter two of the constitution, this automatically includes asylum seekers, refugees, migrants to enjoy equal benefit and protection of the law in the country. As COMSA, we really appreciate the constitution in the way it has been drafted and we really appreciated uh, the background that was laid and how the constitution was drafted by uh, our politicians. The word everyone, which is constantly used in our constitution, brings joy to many people who are living within the South Africa because it simply means that you can be a Movenda speaking somebody, you can be a Lingala speaking somebody, you can be a French speaking somebody, you can be a Zulu speaking somebody, or Kosa, or Shitonga, or Situana, or Sisutu. Either way, you are protected by the constitution. You are part and parcel of, the, of everyone. All migration management, including policy development and implementation by the state, must and should be in accordance to the constitution. This is what becomes very important in how our laws are getting to be drafted and crafted and implemented in the country, because there is no law that should be or must be drafted and implemented if it's not into in accordance to the constitution. It has to be constitutionally compliant. Then it gives us as the civil society organization and other activists and other activist organization to rise up and come to engage any law or any implementation of the policy which is not in line with the constitution. And we are also appreciative of the fact that all our migration policies, including the citizen policies that are crafted within South Africa should comply and must adhere to the constitution. If there's a rise to access to justice, all policies should also be promoting such kind of rights. Migration policies in South Africa are based on social integration approach. Therefore, the constitution provides the survival and livelihood guiding principle for asylum seekers, refugees, and migrants in South Africa. The Bill of Rights guarantees the rights to housing, health care, food, water, social security, and education. However, these rights are not available to everybody immediately. Why they are not available to everyone immediately? Judge Navi Play also indicated that we still have a lot to do relating to access to housing, water, and other social security. These rights need to be applied before they can be realized. Hence, the policies that guide those rights, they need to be in accordance with the constitution. Refugees and asylum seekers and migrants, including all citizens in South Africa, they have got the right to exercise and access 
housing, healthcare, food, water, social security, and access to healthcare services. And all the policies that provide the, guide, the, the guiding principle on how to access those services, they should be in line with the constitution. And we, as COMSA, we appreciate how the constitution has been crafted and how it provides the foundations of all people who are in South Africa in terms of how to, can they access their rights. It also addresses and discourages any form of discrimination, for example, xenophobia, that we have witnessed currently in the past, and we continue to witness very uh, hardship and very brutal xenophobic attacks that we see in the country. More, now, recently, when we were celebrating the Youth Month on the 16th of June, in South Africa, we had to experience the Operation Dudula, where foreign nationals were targeted to be re forcefully removed from their place of residence without the relevant documentation or without the relevant uh, um, authorities involved in the removal of people from their place of residence. The constitution guard against that in terms of the access to justice for those people to be protected. Racial discrimination continue to grow in the country and the violence against gender-based uh, violence continue to grow in South Africa, including sexual orientation violence that we see. The violence targeted or related to the LGBTQI group. The constitution guard against that and it calls upon the relevant chapter nine institution like the Commission for Gender Equality, the South African Human Rights Commission to come on board and say, how best can you promote those rights and you make sure that everybody in South Africa is protected and they can enjoy their rights peacefully, which include asylum seekers, refugees and migrants and the South African citizen at large. We are all equal before the law. The constitution could, uh, the Constitution also provides guidelines on the segregation of power and mandate within the government of South Africa, which then applies to everyone, including all the civil society organization, all the private sector, the businesses, and everyone else, because it is where it has been laid out in the Constitution in terms of where can we address certain issues and who are the relevant bodies to act, engage with when our rights are violated, including the rights to vote. How do we participate in on the voting uh, uh, processes as citizens? And also, it also provides a foundation to migrants in terms of how can they access employment? What are their rights when it comes to the labor uh, issues? What are their rights when it comes to access to healthcare services? which is mostly violated in South Africa when they have to access healthcare services within the healthcare providers. We have derived the following recommendation to the Department of Justice and Constitutional Development. The Department of Justice must continue to work with all relevant stakeholders to enhance constitutional accountability. Because without the stakeholders like the civil society organization, the activists, the private sector, the constitution will just be, remain a booklet. It will remain within the constitutional court for them to up, uphold. But if the Department of Justice, like what I indicated when I was starting, that we have worked a lot as COMSA with the, with the National Department of Justice in promoting uh, the National Action Plan to Combat Racism, Racial Discrimination, Xenophobia, and Related Intolerance. Those are the kind of activities that should be taken into ground so that we can promote the peaceful coexistence of people within our communities. While we are doing that, we will be able to address the high level of gender-based violence, the high level of uh, violence directed to the LGBTQI, and the xenophobic attacks, including the racism and racial discrimination that continue to take place in our community, of which the Constitution highly discourage those actions. For the Department of Justice and Constitutional Development to ensure that copies of the Constitution are available to everyone all the time, regardless of one location. I was so disturbed at one stage uh, when I was doing my community work, when I went to Edu to in Eastern Cape, where I carried a box full of constitution. 
And when I went to the community, when I started distributing the box of constitution, I should thank the Department of uh, Justice National Office for providing the box for us as COMSA to go and distribute in that community. What disturbed me in that regard was the fact that 90% of the participant or 90% of the people that I engaged with, it was their first time putting or laying a hand in the copy of the constitution. And I asked myself, why should it be like that when we have a mandated government to produce and provide the constitution to everyone who lives within the South Africa? So we are urging the Department of Justice and Constitutional Development to make the provision of the constitution to be available in all the magistrate courts or all government building that people go to visit to seek assistance, rather be social development, rather be uh, 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 SASA, rather be uh, health. Any department should have copies of the constitution available in the language of their choice. As you know that in South Africa, we have got different languages. Furthermore, to hold accountable the perpetrators of human rights abusers and viol violation through working with the National Prosecuting Authority, this includes supporting chapter nine institution. We have seen in the past, and we have witnessed that the constitution is there and it provides the foundation in terms of how human rights can be promoted and protected. Then we have to call upon the chapter nine institution to be supported in order to uphold and hold those who violate the human rights because the constitution has made that provisions. So if the chapter nine institution will work in silo without the support from the Department of Justice in enhancing the protection of human rights as enshrined in the Bill of Rights chapter two, it will take and it will be a long journey and we will continue to witness the human rights violation. Also to monitor all policy development and implementation to be in compliance with the constitution. I can assure you and I can also uh, share with you and all the panels and all the attendees that in the past five, seven years, we have seen and we have witnessed, uh, especially in our field, which is the migration field, we have seen that our government through the Department of Home Affairs, they are trying to manage migration through making migration policy very stricter for migrant to be unable to access documentation and other services. So we are saying to the Department of Justice, can they, through the constitution, monitor all the policies and all the laws that are developed by our different uh, uh, departments so that they can be in compliance and they can comply with the constitution so that everybody can be protected before the law and we, the issue of equality can be protected because if the policies that are developed are not in compliance, which means there will be some people, especially the asylum seeker, refugees and migrants, they will be deprived of certain rights because they won't have a free and fair equitable access to the human rights that are given or that are automatically uh, uh, conveyed for them to access. So those are some of the uh, 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 insights that we thought we should be sharing because without the constitution in South Africa, most of the work will not have been carried out. And of course, there will be the gaps like what Jaji uh, Navi Play has indicated that we will uh, uh, continue uh, 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 to witness within the constitution. But those gaps, if the, const if the constitutional uh, uh, development and justice department can come on board and say, let's work together. How best can we work together to make sure that the constitution is adhered to by everyone? Because most of the time when we go to the ground and many people can attest to this, when we go to the ground, there is an element and the belief that the migrant who are the asylum seekers, refugees and economic migrants enjoy more rights and protection from the government as compared to the South African citizens, which is not true. Why is those sentiment being taken on the ground? It's because there is a lack of constitutional education on the ground level in making sure that everyone has got the same rights, same protection of the law. So we are calling upon uh, the Department of Justice to address that gap so that if those gaps are addressed, we might have or we might see a decrease in xenophobic attacks, xenophobic sentiment, and then violence uh, uh, directed to the gender-based uh, uh, violence, including the LGBTI violence, 
and the racism because the constitutional rights and education would have been carried out on a ground level. By those few words, we are saying, this is our constitution. Where will we be 25, 25 years later? Where will we be 27 years into democracy without the constitution, which our target beneficiaries who are asylum seekers and refugees mostly rely on the constitution to receive uh, 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 protection. In closing, it is the very same constitution that we are celebrating today that has laid foundation in scraping the apartheid policies relating to migration. And it then introduces the democratic laws like the Refugee Act of 1998, the Immigration Act of 2002, the Citizenship Act, and other related policies therein, like the laws that uh, 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 Judge Navi players alluded to, PAJA, the Promotion of Just Administrative Act, which is the important law in the, our country where rights are denied or services are denied, I should receive a written reason why. This is why access to justice is so important. By those, those few words, let's uphold our constitution, let's continue to work together so that everybody can have access to the basic rights that are enshrined within the chapter two of the constitution without fear, without favor, and without prejudices because the constitution, it gives rights to everyone except the rights that are politically, that are reserved for the first citizen. Other than that, the rights in the Bill of Rights belongs to everyone who lives within the South African Act because even asylum seekers and refugees and migrants, they did not just come to South Africa. Every country they hold or in, and host migrant. But for South African, because it's a democratic country and it has got a progressive policies that have been put in place, and we have a constitution that make provisions for protection before the law and equality and access to justice. Let's continue to build this country and discourage all social ills that aims to destroy our democracy that has been built over the years, that aims to destroy and tarnish the image of our constitution that we love the most, that makes the South Africa what it is because of the constitution. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, uh, Fulu. It was really well said. It is assuring one that our asylum seekers, our refugees, are indeed well guided by yourself with your immense knowledge, but also your appreciation of the fact that it's something we can do without our constitution. The very document that we celebrate in today, the very book that you say you carry along wherever you go, it indeed is necessary and for sure there are gaps and areas where we need to improve but the response formally will come from our Honorable Deputy Minister later when he responds to a number of your, 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 your recommendations. And we will further, as a department, surely reflect the role. I just needed to, to bring to the floor that um, I've checked on the chat box. There's a need and a request that we, we try to request our speakers to avail their presentation for those that were participating and in attendance, that request will be communicated to them. And uh, 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 by the numbers that I've been checking, we've been having more than 115 people on uh, 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 the web joining and participating in this. The number has been uh, 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 dropping to around 104, but it has never been below 100. And we really welcome those and, and are mindful of the fact that it is a very interesting topic, a topic closer to the hearts of everyone. As I welcome Janine Hicks on the platform, Janine, I, I just noted that uh, part of the area of interest that you're dealing with is in the street law. I must mention that in my years ago at the University of the then University of Zuliland, that's when I met with uh, Professor Carol Bakey on the street law projects, and I'm one of the products of that activity. Uh, we welcome 
you, Carol. Uh, the topic you are going to address, I have already given an intro of your bio. It's how our courts have used the Constitution to leverage people's access to justice and to promote transformative constitutionalism amongst the vulnerable groups like the homeless people. And Oh. Who is I'm changing? Um, may uh, okay. Hi, hi, colleagues. Uh, sorry, I appear to have a glitch as I was about to start talking. Apologies for that. Can you see me now and hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Jenny. We okay, can hear great. you, Jenny. Yes. Great, thank you. Um, and thank you so much, Advocate Mafujani, for that introduction. It's wonderful that you mentioned Carol Bakey. She was my mentor back in 1992, and I worked, managed to work for six years with her at the Community Law Center on rural access to justice. So it's wonderful that you invoked her name. Um, so good afternoon, colleagues. A very good afternoon to Judge Navi Pele. I'm an ardent admirer of your work. Um, to our Deputy Minister, John Jeffrey, my fellow panelists, colleagues within the Department of Justice and online participants in today's important discussion. I'm going to pick up the thread where my fellow participants left off Judge Pillay spoke to us about a context of poverty, inequality, and unemployment, and called for a fundamental transformation of South Africa's society. And Fulu has made an impassioned plea for that society where everyone can enjoy fair and equitable access to justice. My presentation and my input is gonna focus exactly on that, on the implementation of and of access to those equality and socioeconomic rights guarantees in our constitution. And the potential, I stress potential, of those guarantees in our constitution to transform this embedded discrimination and the historic and widening inequality that we witness in our society. In a nutshell, the argument, the case that I'm going to make is that it should not be left to our courts alone to drive the transformation project of our society. Our state, the government is obliged to devise policies and implement programs needed to bring about this transformation in society to give effect to the kinds of results that, that FULU has been calling for. Um, our government's current policy approach, I argue, is distinctly anti-poor and it does not give effect to the principles, values and rights contained in our constitution. Um, and as part of my argument, I'm going to provide some examples, to my mind, of the highs and the lows um, that we've witnessed in this regard to illustrate my point. So as a starting point, let me just talk about this call for and the case for a transformative constitutionalism. What does that mean? Um, when we look at, and I love that we're all carrying around our mini pocket version of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, the principles, the values and the rights contained within our constitution, I argue, have been used predominantly by our courts. They've been used by our courts to leverage access to justice and to promote transformative constitutionalism. And it's by no accident that that happens because the constitution itself stipulates and spells out very clearly an obligation on our courts to adopt a transformative jurisprudential approach when they interpret the Bill of Rights. Um, there's very clear provisions um, stating that when courts are interpreting the Bill of Rights, they must promote the values that underlie an open and democratic society based on and the key magic words that come up again and again in all our equality um, case law, human dignity, equality, and freedom. These go to the heart of the issues of equality, human dignity, equality, and freedom. Um, the Constitution goes further to say that when interpreting any legislation, so when there's any legislation that's being challenged, um, or when there is common law that needs to be interpreted, every court must promote the spirit, purport, and objects of the Bill of Rights. Now, in understanding what the potential of this transformation project can bring about, 
um, I make reference to the work of Kathy Albertain, who argues that this transformation project has as its objective the attainment of these values of dignity, the achievement of equality, and the advancement of human rights and freedoms, linked with the eradication of the poverty and the inequality that Judge Pillay was talking about. This transformation aims to improve the quality of life and free the potential of all persons. It requires the attainment of substantive equality, which is quite distinct from formal notions of equality, which requires the use of remedial and redistributive, redistributive measures to ensure that people can satisfy their basic needs and enjoy equal levels of well-being. Okay, so in this regard, there have been calls for a more interventionist state. We need a state, a government that assumes stronger positive duties to respect, protect, promote, and fulfill the rights contained in the Constitution, including taking the necessary remedial and redistribution measures to address those areas of persistent institutionalized inequality and discrimination. I'm going to um, give you some examples of the highs in terms of, um, to my mind, these are highs in our past 25 years of working with this constitution. Um, I believe that our courts have a critical role to play, particularly within the context of a separation of powers. Um, our courts have the power and the responsibility to hold the state to account in fulfilling its obligations and upholding a pro-poor constitutional democracy. Um, our courts have provided a platform for transformation, a platform for and an opportunity for social justice advocates to bring challenges to state policy to the forum of our courts for adjudication. And I'm just going to put on, I had a whole host of examples, but because of um, time constraints, I'm had to whittle it down to my three favorite cases. Um, and I'm going to call on three of them, the Ngomani judgment, Mashlangu, and the Hruitbun judgment. So the Ngomani judgment, this was a 2019 case. Um, this was Ngomani and others against the city of Johannesburg Metropolitan Municipality. While I'm, I'm going to tell you some stories now, really, um, and while I'm telling you these stories, what I'd like you to seize upon, really, is the power of our constitution and how our courts have leveraged those rights of freedom, equality, and dignity to bring about that transformative impact and address um, the violation of rights that have been experienced by ordinary people. So in the Ngomani judgment here, the court censured the city of Johannesburg for its treatment of homeless people. What had happened there, and this story will sound very familiar and to Durbanites, a group of people had been living under a bridge in the city for four years and keeping their meager possessions, their cardboard boxes, their shelter, their pieces of corrugated iron, their bags, their blankets. They'd been keeping that stashed under the bridge during the day. The city alleged that the site where they were living and their um, possessions was obstructing the pavement and enabling crime. So the city conducted a cleanup raid. They confiscated and they destroyed the property of the homeless people living there. Now the court held that that conduct of the Metropolitan Police and the destruction of homeless people's property that was deemed to be unlawful and unconstitutional. The court upheld homeless people's right to dignity, to privacy, and not to be deprived of their property. The court stated that the conduct of the government personnel, the Metropolitan Police, was not only a violation of the applicant's property rights in their belongings, but it was also disrespectful and demeaning, which obviously caused them distress, and it was a breach of their right to have their inherent dignity respected and protected. I turn now to Mashlangu, my second favorite case, Mashlangu and another versus the Minister of Labor and others. This was a wonderful judgment um, handed down by our, our outgoing judge president in, in 2020, um, a case heard before the Constitutional Court. The Con Court was required to consider um, in law the exclusion of domestic workers, so domestic workers employed in private households like yours and mine, domestic workers had previously been excluded from the definition of employee in our COIDA legislation, which is compensation for occupational injuries and diseases. What is the impact of that? It means that if a domestic worker suffered an accident or an injury or even a death during the course of her employment, um, she would not be entitled to compensation. 
um, the applicants now on behalf of the domestic workers, Mashlangu, made the case that that exclusion constitutes indirect discrimination on the basis of race and gender. They drew out the intersectionalities of race and gender because domestic workers are predominantly black women. Um, I want to call out two specific um, comments, very powerful comments made by the court. Noting that the cornerstone of any young democracy is a comprehensive social security system, particularly for the most vulnerable members of society. The court held that that exclusion constitutes a violation of domestic workers' rights to equality and dignity and declared that section constitutionally invalid. However, and I'm, I'll, if I have a chance to, I'm going to come back to um, this comment by the court. If we're talking about the power of our constitution to transform our society, the court in Mashlangu stated that the founding values of the constitution as expressed in the preamble, confirm that one of the aims of the constitution is to heal the divisions of the past, improve the quality of life of all citizens, and free the potential of each person. The court went on and made reference to its earlier decision in the Twane City versus Afri Forum case. And it noted that this principle in the preamble, and here comes the heavy, bold, underlined, underscored section, this principle in the preamble imposes a constitutional obligation on the state to eradicate all systems of subordination and oppression inherited from South Africa's colonial and apartheid past. So here we have a court telling us very strongly that this preamble in this constitution imposes an obligation on the state, a positive obligation to eradicate all systems of subordination and oppression inherited from our colonial and apartheid pasts. Now it has come before our courts as our final case that I want to draw your attention to, the Hrutwim judgment. Many of us in the socioeconomic rights and the social justice sphere come back to the Hrutwim judgment over and over again because it sets a standard for us in terms of what can we expect of the government. Um, Fulu has just read out everyone is entitled to health, to social security. I've spoken about property and dignity rights and equality rights. What is the standard set for the government? If the state is obliged to promote and protect those rights, what can we expect of the state? It's in the Grootboom judgment, which is a case Irene Grootboom and others um, who'd moved from an informal settlement, this is in the Cape, and unlawfully occupied a piece of private land because of the desperate circumstances they were living under and the municipality evicted them. Um, and these were people who had no basic shelter, no housing, and they sought a court order requiring the government to provide them with adequate basic shelter. Um, this was appealed to the Kong court um, and the, the constitutional court that in any challenge, so where government, where the state has been challenged regarding its delivery on for instance, socioeconomic rights, and in this case, it was housing, the question will be whether the legislative and other measures taken by the state are reasonable. So we've just said the state has to eradicate the legacy of our colonial and apartheid past. The state is obliged to protect and promote these principles and rights and the values in the constitution. And the question then arises, is government doing enough? The court tells us, the state measures will be deemed to be reasonable if they are comprehensive, if they are well coordinated, if they can facilitate the progressive realization of the right in question, if those measures are balanced and flexible, if they do not exclude a significant segment of society, and importantly, if they prioritize the urgent needs of those in desperate circumstances. Okay, I could read out a host of other judgments relating, for instance, to the right of same-sex couples to marry, to adopt, the right to employment of non-citizens and of permanent residents, property rights of women and customary marriages, and rights on inheritance. These judgments provide a powerful illustration of what our courts have undertaken. But above all, they provide a powerful illustration of the potential of our constitution, the transformative potential of our constitution, and how it can be used to eradicate discriminatory provisions in our law that still exist. But above all, how they can be used to address state failure to deliver on access to social goods such as land, water, housing, social security, 
which impact on millions of people in our country, and particularly on categories of people who have suffered persistent discrimination and inequality, and accord them appropriate relief. Um, it's my view that the implementation of such constitutional guarantees is key to transforming the unequal, discriminatory and prejudiced society um, in which we live. Um, now speaking to the lows, unfortunately, my friends, um, I must talk to the persistent embedded inequality and lows um, that are manifest within our society um, and to which insufficient attention has been paid, I believe, by the state. So this embedded inequality, um, as Judge Pillay um, spoke at the beginning of this, this seminar, it was evident and made manifest in the racial tensions that were highlighted during the recent rioting in my province, in KwaZulu-Natal in particular. The embedded inequality and the desperation within many communities has been aggravated by the impact of COVID-19 and the lockdown measures on our, on our economy. We see the embedded inequality and discrimination in our widening and deepening poverty in the increasing levels of gender-based violence that Fudu made reference to. But above all of grave concern is that inequality is manifest in the challenges that ordinary people experience every day in trying to access um, those socioeconomic rights provided for in our constitution, including the right to social security, the right to land, the right to housing, the right to a clean and safe environment. And to my mind, these stark realities um, represent the lows. The fact that after 25 years of constitutionally guaranteed equality and the guarantee of the full and equal enjoyment of all rights and freedoms, we still live in such an unequal society. In my view, the implementation of this constitutional potential and of the rights and the freedoms in captured in our constitution needs to be radically improved to achieve um, the potential offered by our constitution. And I want to cite just two examples, um, Advocate Mafujani, just um, to, to illustrate uh, um, on what basis I make that claim. Um, and there are two schisms that I particularly want to point to. The one is formal versus informal, and the one is citizen versus other, okay? So formal versus informal. Currently, only workers who are recognized as employees by our labor law framework, our unemployment insurance legislation, our labor relations legislation, only those who recognize as employees qualify for social security benefits, such as unemployment insurance, workers' compensation, maternity benefits. As a result, we have a whole swathe of our working population, self-employed workers, own account workers, independent contractors, and the myriad of informal sector workers um, who hold South Africa together have no access to these um, forms of social protection, resulting in real financial hardship within their families, particularly for those for informal employment. Less than 10% of workers in sub-Saharan Africa um, have access to social security, whereas in other developing countries, this goes up to around 50% of workers have, have access to social security. We have testimonies from self-employed women in South Africa who speak spe specifically about the hardships and the tough choices that they experience in relation to sexual and reproductive health rights as a result of the, their lack of access to paid maternity leave. So self-employed workers, informal economy workers, the mamas who are selling sweets and bananas and clothes on the side of the road cannot take paid maternity leave um, upon falling pregnant. To my mind, there's a strong case to be made that this is a failure by the state to regulate and enable access to the constitutional right to social security as envisaged by section 27. This is a derogation of the state's res responsibility to enact reasonable legislative and other measures within available resources to achieve the progressive realization of these rights. It constitutes differential treatment between workers as violation of our, our section nine of the constitution. I'm pleased to say that this matter is currently before the South African Law Reform Commission on a project on which I serve and which has acknowledged this lacuna in our legislation. And we have, we're very proud to have just released a discussion document presenting proposed reform on the legislative framework in this regard. Um, I'm going to speed up a bit and bring you to um, my second point, which is in relation to citizens versus other. 
I made reference to that in Gomani judgment um, against the city of Johannesburg against homeless people. To my mind, this indicates the clear need for transformation in how our state and how municipalities are approaching and policing homelessness and informal trade. Um, what we are seeing in the main is that municipalities are enforcing, in many instances, apartheid era municipal bylaws that are no longer fit for an entirely different socioeconomic set of contexts um, and are simply unconstitutional. In my province, in my city of Eteguini, the Eteguini municipality continues to use irrational and vaguely termed municipal bylaws to victimize and unfairly discriminate against homeless people. We have a host of research undertaken by the Human Sciences Research Council, work done by the Dennis Hurley Center, a local NGO. I'm very proud of um, some of our final year street law students at the School of Law um, are interning and volunteering at the Hurley Center, taking statements of abuse of homeless people. What we're seeing is that officials are using their own discretion and deciding what constitutes the promotion of public order and what behavior constitutes loitering or vagrancy, such as urinating, bathing, or sleeping in public. And as a result, we are seeing instances of unlawful arrests, unlawful detention, harassment, extortion, and abuse by our metropolitan security officers and personnel of vulnerable groups of people, such as homeless people, sex workers, informal traders, street children, confiscating, destroying property without following due and fair procedure simply because they can get away with it. Ngomane tells us that this is a violation, this is unfair, unlawful discrimination, and it's a violation of the rights to equality and to dignity. What I'm going to move towards then, really, in conclusion, colleagues, when considering these highs, what our courts have been able to achieve in utilizing these provisions and rights within the Constitution, and the lows, the perpetuating of inequality and discrimination through our existing legislative um, framework in many instances, but equally through state policy, through state programs, and through state practice. The question that arises for me, and um, Deputy Minister, I would appreciate input and insight from our participants on this, do we need to take every instance of inequality and injustice to our courts to force our state to overhaul discriminatory legislation or to force our government to enact meaningful policy to ensure delivery on socioeconomic rights for us to attain the progressive realization of rights envisaged by the Constitution? My view is that we need a far more proactive administration to identify such gaps in our legislative framework for law reform, um, such as the project on maternity benefits. We need coordinated monitoring and reporting between state and civil society um, to identify shortcomings in policy, information, policy implementation. And above all, we need political accountability for policy failures by the state and the violation of rights that ensues. So accordingly, what I would like to ask, and I would appreciate input and discussion on this, how do we get the state to reset the policy agenda? How do we get government to enact policies and programs that are pro-poor, that are rights-based, and that promote the attainment of equality? Our constitution offers the promise of a transformed society. And as I hope I've demonstrated, our courts have in many instances taken up that mandate to hold the state to account in interpreting those constitutional rights and freedoms. How do we create an environment where, and Dennis Davis uses the expression, where politics, rather more so than the work of judges, determines the scope of the constitution and its possible implementation? Where politics, rather than judges, determine the scope of the constitution and its possible implementation? I argue this requires a new political agenda it requires citizen pressure on political parties. It requires effective oversight by parliament of the executive. And it requires the ongoing use of our courts to challenge racial and class-based inequality and inadequate implementation by the government of the provisions and obligations outlined by the constitution. So while our courts have proven their ability to use the constitution 
to eradicate inequality and promote redress, our challenge, I argue, is fundamentally one of the politics of law. Do our political leaders and do our government departments have the vision, the courage, and the capacity to drive the transformation of our society? What will it take for our state to take appropriate legislative and other measures to use our constitution to its full potential and eradicate, I'm using the words um, of Mahlangu again, eradicate all systems of subordination and oppression inherited from South Africa's colonial and apartheid past, particularly when such measures challenge that inherent embedded economic power imbalance that is so prevalent in our society. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Janine. I have, and I believe everybody has really noted the, the role that you indicate our courts have played, the jurisprudence that we have gathered to show how, to what extent the courts have actively assisted in ensuring and promoting those constitutional rights that they are meaningful. And you note in your, your, the laws, and I am now mindful of the time and wouldn't stay much longer in uh, 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 my comments. Safe to say, Jenny, my latest and exciting judgment is the central judgment on the, on the rights of uh, women, particularly the marital status of the women after, after the death of their husbands and the fact that that judgment is retrospective. And that's the part that really excites me. And how even the court was creative in trying to say, sure that uh, 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 those that are affected are not automatically just nullifying whatever has happened. You can then approach court to say, to what extent it can be corrected. I am excited and thankful that indeed there is a recognition that part of our separation of powers the judiciary is doing an exciting work there. And indeed, um, our government has so much to do, but I think best to respond there to is our seasoned human rights uh, 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 participant and activist, our deputy minister. I have noted that there weren't many of the questions on the, on the common chat box, and I'm therefore having this opportunity, DM, apologies that we are cutting on your 30 minutes, but over to you, DM, to reflect and respond to these uh, 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 informative and insightful and a balanced view that our panelists has presented. Jenny, thank you very much. Over to you. Thanks. Thanks very much, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, also, thanks to Advocate Mafujane. Um, he introduced us, but he wasn't introduced. Uh, and just to say that Advocate Mafujane is the, uh, the chief master. Um, so dealing with all uh, estates, wills, insolvencies, and, and matters like that. So you can maybe also contact him on the, uh, the chat group if you've got, if you've got issues. Um, also just to say that, that this uh, um, webinar was organized by the Regional Office of the Department of Justice in KwaZulu-Natal. Uh, the intention is uh, that all regional offices will organize uh, some kind of event for the 25th anniversary of the Constitution. This is the first one that, that KZN has, has done. And to thank uh, the regional uh, head, uh, Ms. Pat Moodley, for, for the hard work that she's put in particularly in a very difficult period uh, in, in KwaZulu-Natal. Um, the, the sort of brief I've got is, is basically to, to respond, um, uh, which is sort of quite, quite tough. I mean, there's some specific, I think it's, I think the, all three inputs have been very good, um, raised a lot of issues. Uh, Janine's at the end was particularly uh, hard hitting um, but just, I think, to say that, that um, you know, we, we um, there are highs and there are lows of the Constitution. Um, I think the panelists have spoken a lot about, about both, both sides, the highs being uh, the justiciable socioeconomic rights, uh, 
uh, the supremacy of the Constitution, which I want to come back to, uh, to later. And that has led to um, significant improvements. Um, for example, um, uh, 14.6 learners at school in 2019, participation was almost universal, 96.6% by the age of 15, which is the last compulsory age. Uh, percentage of learners attending no-fee schools improving from 21.4% to 66.2%. Uh, social grants, uh, the numbers of people going up from 30.9% in, um, sorry, going up uh, up to 30.9% in 2019 and 45.5% of households receive one or more grants. Um, the, the issue of access to, to water and electricity uh, increasing quite um, substantially, electricity 76.7% uh, to 85% um, in 2019 um, and so on. Now, the problem with those statistics is, yes, they're real, they're factual, those are from Stats SA, but tell that to the person who has a household which doesn't have electricity uh, or a household which doesn't have access to, to pipe water. So that's, that's understandable. Uh, um, Janine particularly focused on, on um, well, many of, many of the speakers, I think Judge Pillay as well, the... Um, the problems, the lows, the poverty, the inequality, the unemployment, the weak economic growth, uh, the racism, xenophobia, and homophobia. So we've got good laws outlawing them. Uh, but um, in terms of the way people live their daily lives, uh, some people, um, they still live it by ex exhibiting racism, uh, xenophobia, or, or homophobia. Uh, GBV is a gender-based violence, is a huge challenge, um, yet we've got equality of, of, of women. Uh, but you can't speak of freedom or human dignity for women if they're not safe in their homes, in their schools, or in their communities. So, um, but I think, I think the main low is, is the stark inequalities, um, the high inequality between uh, the rich and, and the poor. And those are things that, that a lot more needs to be done, that, that needs to be addressed. Um, just to say, though, that, that I mean, some of the points um, when Judge Pillay was, was referring to the, um, I think the organization was IDEA. I can't remember now what it stood for. I didn't note down what it stood for. Uh, the issues of their complaints on the 20th review relating to um, one party dominance uh, that's not really the Constitution's fault. The Constitution sets up an electoral system. Uh, there's debates around the electoral system, but what it does do is ensure that the representation in the legislatures, parliament, um, it, the party support in those bodies is proportionate to the vote that the people, the votes actually cast. Uh, and that even applies at, at, uh, at, at local government level where you do have a ward system. There has been some debate. There's been the My Vote Counts uh, case at, the, um, uh, at the, the, the Constitutional Court, which said that independence must be allowed to, to stand. We may well move to a similar system to a municipal level where you have um, uh, independent, well, you have uh, wards effectively where individuals can stand and then the proportional representation system uh, balances out so that the balance those things out so each party actually has uh, the support that it actually uh, the the majority or the size in the in the council is the same as the support that they uh, that they got in the votes um, and that's better i mean if you look at um, you know other countries uh, the united states um, you can have a a well you can very nearly have a president who got a few million votes less than uh, his his competitor becoming president in terms of, of um, uh, Trump. If if a certain key states had had uh, had voted another way, uh, Donald Trump would have been the president. Um, Hillary Clinton beat Donald Trump in terms of the number of popular votes in the United Kingdom. Um, uh, you've never actually had a government since universal franchise. You've never actually had a government 
elected by the majority of people who voted in that election um, uh, because of the first past the post system. In other words, you vote for your MP at a constituency and all the, if they win by one vote, all the other votes cast for the other parties or the other candidates just get discarded. So I'm just, I went into that in a bit more detail in, in terms of, of just saying these are, you know, these are complicated areas and, and we need to, to debate them. Um, the, there was, I mean, Judge Pele raised the issue of the problem of, of an anti-corruption unit not being in our constitution, and, and that is something that is being looked at um, uh, and, and considered uh, not necessarily in the constitution, but at least setting up a, a statutory body. I presume in 1994, uh, although the apartheid regime had been pretty corrupt, I think there was maybe a hope that the democratic regime would uh, get democratic government would not be. Um, but uh, I mean, clearly that is, has not has not worked. Um, the uh, then just um, some of the the other responses, um, just in terms of um, monitoring. Uh, sorry, just in terms of educating the public, it was uh, Fulu's uh, point of, of the, and uh, educating the public about the Constitution. Look, the Constitution is available in, in all 11 languages and in, in Braille. Uh, we all have also produced, uh, mainly for learners in schools, a, what we call a slimline Constitution, which is the preamble of the uh, chapter one in the Bill of Rights, and then a section at the back about the, particularly the chapter nine institutions. But definitely much more needs to be done as far as constitutional awareness. And I think that we also um, need to work with civil society on that. Then on just responding to, to some of uh, Janine's points. Uh, look, I, I would disagree obviously that, um, uh, you know, the, the government can definitely do better or the ruling party, because it's a party-based issue, could do better. But things like the National Development Plan, I think, I mean, are you, are you saying that that is not, um, uh, not geared to uh, dealing with inequality, poverty, uh, and it's not right-based? So, and that's the, the, the prime document of, of government. Uh, so... Um, this government tries very or well, continually evaluates are its policies in line, particularly with the electoral mandate it received, uh, the the uh, issues outlined in the um, in the manifesto of, of the ruling party at the time. I can't the manifesto at the time of the ruling party. I can't speak for for other parties. And uh, basically, from, from government side, all laws, uh, before they go to parliament, get uh, certified by the state law advisors as being consistent with the constitution. Uh, the same applies to, to any policies, uh, any regulations. One could obviously uh, disagree with them, and sometimes they have been wrong. Uh, but there is an effort to, uh, to ensure that there's consistency with the, with the constitution. Um, but one of the, I think, the strongest points of our constitution is the supremacy of the constitution and um, the fact that it is the constitutional court, a body of uh, 11 people, um, uh, where you have to get a majority. Uh, I think the quorum, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, anyone, I think the quorum is, is nine, so it would then be a majority of, of five at least to decide what is constitutional and what isn't. I think that in this current period, particularly in KwaZulu-Natal, uh, with the arrest of, of um, the, the arrest ordered by the former president, by the Constitutional Court, and the fact, fact that that arrest was, was effected uh, before the deadline, show the importance of the, the supremacy of the Constitution. There's been a lot of calls um, for Mr. Zuma to be, to be released. Um, the matter is still in the Constitutional Court in terms of waiting judge, uh, judgment on the rescission application. So it's, it's quite difficult for government to intervene at, at this stage. But we also need to look at, uh, you know, sometimes a Constitutional Court can give a ruling you don't like. 
but it's the best system. You've got to accept it. Uh, in the past, um, the National Party regime uh, had a constitution. Uh, they managed, because the constitution wasn't that strong, they managed to oust the courts in a number of incidents, instances. They also made pretty sure about who was going to be judging in the courts. So there was the incident, uh, for those who know history, of the attempt by the National Party to remove colored people from the voters' role. Uh, the appellate division, which was the um, highest court at the time, uh, ruled against that. And so the uh, National Party government then went and increased the size. They couldn't get rid of the judges, but they increased the size of the appellate division and appointed judges that they knew would, would side with them. So that's what's happened in our, in our past. If we don't have the constitution, the constitutional court adjudicating on what's correct or incorrect in the constitution, even if they get it wrong, then who else do we have? Uh, the issue of parliament has, has, I think, across the world shown the limitations, uh, particularly when it comes to the um, protection of people's rights, uh, the limitations of, of that. If you had a referendum on um, in, uh, when, when were civil unions passed in 93, uh, 2003 or something, if a referendum was passed then as to whether same-sex couples should be allowed to marry, um, it probably would have been rejected. I think the tolerance has increased. Um, and if you, if you had a referendum on many issues um, uh, where, where people have their rights protected, you probably wouldn't, we probably would, none of us would probably, or most of us probably wouldn't like the results. So I just do want to emphasize the importance of, of constitutional supremacy, and that is the role of the, the courts. Um, obviously, because everything is reviewable based largely, uh, there's a lot of litigation going on. Um, you can have on the, um, on the, the disaster regulations, a high court in, in Johannesburg uh, saying, agreeing with an applicant that the restrictions were uh, irrational and, and not correct. That was that own judge's view. But you end up then going to uh, the, the, the Supreme Court of Appeal where there's a different uh, position. So that also does happen with our, with our courts. Um, yeah, uh, so um, I, I see we're sort of largely running out of time. Um, so let me, let me stop there. Uh, but from the side of, of uh, the Ministry of Justice to thank everyone for their, their participation. Um, and I'll hand it back to Advocate Mafujane. Thank you very much, GM, for, for your response and for the indication that indeed uh, ours is the supremacy of the Constitution. GM was supposedly just a confirmation, the, the quorum of the concord. Uh, sorry, Advocate, uh, Advocate, 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 sorry, I forgot yes, to yes. respond to one comment that was specifically to me. I was trying to read the new ones, but but just if I give me a minute to do to just respond. And that was from I at the the number was Huawei P30 Lite. I don't know the name, but it was about the, the murders in Phoenix and Bombay. Uh, basically, um, those need to be investigated properly. I've also seen on social media some of the videos of, of the ill treatment uh, of, of, of people. Um, there needs to be an investigation, and there is an investigation into that. So that is being investigated. Uh, and... and um, and then there's the issue of, of the SANDF not being deployed in Cape Town with the, uh, with the taxi conflict. Um, I know the Minister of Transport is directly involved with that. I, I can't uh, respond directly as to what the need is, whether there have been requests or whatever. Uh, also, just to say that the uh, Human Rights Commission will tomorrow, uh, they told me, I hope they have announced it, be having a, a virtual imbezo uh, on the whole issue of, of the, uh, the public violence in KwaZulu-Natal and, and Gauteng. Um, so just if I can give that by way of response. My apologies, Advocate Mafujane, for interrupting you. No. Thanks, Diem. Uh, 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 it's uh, understood. And uh, I was just uh, going to say that uh, the, the quorum of the Concord in terms of section 167, subsection 2, it's eight judges. And um, I think uh, the time we have allocated for today really 
flew on our face as we were thinking that we're trying to craft and create a vibrant interaction. But I have seen that in the chat box, many of the questions or comments that came, most or part of the, of the panelists have responded there too. Particularly even as the DM was concluding, it touched on one of those questions. So, so basically, this is an ongoing activity from, from the justice in celebrating the 25 years of our constitution. This is not the end. We will be going to very many other provinces. Thanks, DM, for reminding us and alerting us to the very good work and very, very involved work under very trying circumstances by our regional office in an attempt to stage and ensure that today's webinar takes place. We are appreciative of uh, our leader there, the regional head, Pat Moodley and her team for ensuring that uh, we really succeed in staging this. I want to express my gratitude and thankfulness further to the Deputy Minister for taking the time to listen and to put into perspective the government position in responding to our esteemed uh, uh, panelists as they put forward what has been their view and their assessment of how we dealt with the constitution. We, we thank you, DM, for being available and for the insights and your activism for the human rights that you articulate so well and sharply can see where we basically may be misjudging it in so far as how we take perhaps some of the developments. I want to thank Judge Navi Pillay for having also so well expressed and indicated the jurisprudence and the international experience. My gratitude goes further also to Fulu on reflecting and encouraging us as a government and its employees to look into the policies that will insist and ensure that the, 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 the refugees and asylum seekers are treated properly. And also the message to be saying more and more of these constitutional documents have to be shared so that people can relate to this document and be informed by it. Janine, we thank you very much for looking at basically how our courts have been dealing with. What is really inspiring is the fact that at least from all of the three panelists, there isn't one that says even our judicial arm is dropping the, 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 the ball, but indeed, we are in all spheres of, of government would try and look at how we can best do it. We surely request you to keep looking in the space. The Department of Justice will continue for a year or so to continue to celebrate and stay these webinars where we celebrate the existence of our constitution, the 25 years. And perhaps we may even reflect back and say between the 20th year to now the 25th year, are we doing better? Is there improvement? But we are more grateful to all who came and participated and to our, our, our panelists. And we thank you for attending and are closing the events. Thank you very much. Have a pleasant evening. Bye.